everyone. Thank you for joining us for the Human Side. Before we begin, we would like to extend a brief message of strength and care to you. We are living through tough times, especially with the second COVID wave in India. And we sincerely hope that your family and you are safe. We are grateful to have you with us here and we hope that certain aspects of this conversation might help us to understand the current situation a little bit better, especially to explore our position as social scientists in this crisis situation. So over the past year, we have witnessed the development of COVID pandemic situation. This has been a global crisis where the physical sciences have significantly contributed towards understanding the nature of virus, the ways in which it has been developing, and most importantly, the rolling out of vaccines to manage the situation. Uh, this is, of course, a very short and non-exhaustive list of the ways in which physical sciences have helped us during the pandemic situation. Along with the physical sciences, human and social sciences have enabled the translation of scientific information into actionable insights, say in the form of public policy decisions. Social scientists also have been critical in communicating scientific information to the public. Social scientists are also a fundamental tool to analyze the cognitive assessment and collective behaviors that have developed during the pandemic. In many ways, at least publicly, <coughs> there has been a lack of discussion about the role of social scientists during the pandemic, which does not reflect the extent of contributions that social scientists do and have made over the past year. The human side is a humble attempt to talk about the ways in which social scientists from various disciplines have looked at and contributed to understand the pandemic. We believe that social sciences are decisive in shaping the collective management of this and future epidemics and pandemics. To, end, to this end, we have with us today three distinguished panel speakers. Please join me in welcoming the first panel speaker of human side, sociologist Alia Rao. She is an assistant professor in the Department of Methodology. Her research on interests and the study of work and organizations, family, gender, economic sociology, and emotions. She uses qualitative methods to understand social mechanisms, which may facilitate or impede the production of inequalities at work and in families. Thank you for being here, Alia. The second, the second panel speaker for today is philosopher Jan Helge Solbach. He is a Norwegian physician, theologian, and professor of medical ethics at the University of Oslo. His main fields of research are moral residue, the didactics of bioethics and science ethics, research ethics, and integrity in research. He's also involved in several international capacity building projects in research ethics and research integrity. We are glad to have you here with us, Jan. And the third panel speaker is historian Monica Green. She was previously a professor of history at Arizona State University. She is an expert in the history of women's healthcare and pre -modern, in pre-modern Europe, medicine and gender, and she specializes in the history of infectious diseases in pre-modern period. It's wonderful to have you with us here, Monica. Thank you. Now, before we move on to the first segment, I thought we could do a quick round of hi from our moderators for today uh, from OP Jinder Global University. Here is sociologist Juhi Singh. His Hello. Historian Swamya yeah. Day and uh, philosopher. I uh, feel a bit vain saying that, but I'm going to go forward and say philosopher. Hi there, uh, Sahana. Yeah. Unfortunately, Richa could not join us. She is our dear friend and she's going through a little bit of a tough time. So, uh, from afar, thank you, Richa, for helping us through this. So, the second segment is uh, uh, talking about the actual theme of the, the symposium, which is on the role of social scientists in the pandemic. And I thought we could start by looking at a bust the myth around kind of thing that the naive conception of social sciences. So, during the pandemic situation, there is a certain sense in which, at least early on, when sciences were mentioned, publicly, it was always conflated with physical sciences alone, that is either epidemiology and virology. Even today, as it was shown by follow the science trend, there's a certain way in which human or social sciences are not really considered vital to the process of responding to the crisis. We thought we could start by uh, looking at uh, where you could share, you know, all, uh, our panel speakers, if you could share any misconceptions or areas of ignorance about the role of social science. Have you encountered these during your experience as researchers with the pandemic situation? So anyone uh, who might be interested in taking, you know, Monica or Jan well, or- I, I, I'd be glad to, um, uh, to address that in terms of history. And that's simply that I have encountered this over and over again, and it was not simply during the, the pandemic. Um, it's been in previous encounters of uh, um, communicating with, with scientists, which is the assumption that history is fixed. History happened in the past. It can't possibly change. 
And therefore, you know, why not just, you know, pull data off of Wikipedia? Um, I mean, that with just so little conception of history as a research field, um, cons uh, any conception that history, our historical narratives change when we have new information. I mean, and that's why I've been able to, to redate the Black Death is because I had new information. And I took the new information and then put it into um, a, a dialogue with the old uh, information and figured out, okay, why had we been misunderstanding this? Um, so that's just huge, is that just because it's the past, it, it, technically the past can't change, but it, the past can change in terms of our knowledge of it. So really just going back to what Jan was saying, how much we don't know. And a lot of what we don't know is simply because we've never asked the questions. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, please. Yeah. I don't know whether Monica would agree with me, but for me, I would, I would define history as the most important academic discipline to understand the present. Uh, I agree entirely. <laughs> Okay, so uh, so now that we have looked at that, Alia, would you like to add in anything? And uh, is there, would you like to add as a sociologist, what kind of misconceptions or areas of ignorance you might have heard people having? Yeah, sure. Um, I think it's not like a misunderstanding as much as it is a sense of irrelevance. And I think especially when it comes to, um, you know, I teach qualitative research methods here. I'm a sociologist by training, but that's what I teach here. And this sense that somehow that's not data data only comes in the form of numbers and stats and things like that. And I mean, like all we are seeing um, right now, like, you know, whether it's vaccine hesitancy, whether it's not following like, you know, sanitization or wearing masks so or whatever it might be, a lot of that, um, some in India, like a lot in the US, in the UK where I am right now, this is explained, I think, by talking to people, by understanding, okay, like, where is this vaccine hesitancy, for instance, coming from? Why, why is not wearing a mask? Why has that become such a key part of your identity that you're like, I mean, I will die for this right to not wear a mask, right? Like that's where sociologists, I think, are doing some really great work about how um, identity, like belonging in a group and so on is shaping that. Um, and I think it's really a lot of qualitative researchers who are doing that, who are kind of doing the in-depth interviews, who are doing the observations and so on. Um, so yeah, I would just add that this, idea of what data is and what can inform how we understand the social world, I think it still remains a bit uh, narrow. In continuation with that, I thought we could look at one small aspect of like you had talked about uh, the idea of, uh, of subject of words, the importance of words. So I thought that before moving on to talking about methodology, we could talk about coming to the pulp of our theme, the social scientists, you know, we want to focus on a specific aspect of the situation. Very roughly, one of the reasons physical sciences are often revered is the lack of subjectivity. There is a certain sense in which the elimination of subjectivity is considered to be preferable uh, than to its inclusion within a study. So have you come across a view in your experience in conversations that compares physical and social sciences? So what do you think is the value of subjectivity for studying a situation like the current one? So um, anyone would like to take, uh, take that up? Jan. I, I, I will um, start with that. It's, and it uh, builds off of, of what Jan was saying. Um, as I said before, I've taken, um, drawn from global history, this idea of, of scalar um, analysis of, of saying that, that certain kinds of analyses, certain methodologies are to be used at different scales. And there's different sources of, of, of information. And the important thing is that when you see it that way, one doesn't trump the other. Is that if you're looking at bacteria, then you have to use scientific methods because um, the, the scientific means to, to document bacteria, um, whether in a, in a laboratory context or a molecular analysis, that's the work that scientists do. And they have their methodologies, they have their, their criteria, their, their protocols and so forth. I have the same things when I'm reading documents, which are human generated. So I'm, there I'm at the, the, the human scale of analysis. And when you're reading human documents, there are certain kinds of analyses you have to use. And this is one of the things that drives, for example, art historians crazy, and also frankly, medical historians of somebody coming along and seeing a picture 
of, of something from the past and doing a retrospective diagnosis of it. And it's just like, no, <laughs> you cannot do that. You have to understand their conventions of art that are peculiar to that time. That is the language of art. Um, and that you work in a certain kind of idiom. It's a certain kind of grammar. Um, there are certain kinds of, of cultural references. There are certain things that you would never do or certain things that, that it, it might look like to us, it looks like you're trying to do, but in fact, you had complete, you person in the past had completely different intentions. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's what I do. When I'm working on the human level, I'm saying culture, 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 um, and all the ways that humanities and social sciences have spent centuries honing our analyses of how to document what humans do. If we wanna look at dendrochronology, <laughs> yes, that's a different um, uh, story. So it really just, um, it's, it's kind of uh, just reinforcing the necessity and uh, the vitalness of saying different kinds of evidence and different kinds of phenomena demand different techniques. Full stop. Yeah, mm. that's true. And uh, hey, uh, Alia, is there anything we would, you might be interested in adding to the conversation between subjectivity and objectivity? Would yeah, I, um, I actually had thoughts on the last question. Can I share those? <laughs> yes, please. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, what I had about that was, and this was like linked to what Jan had also said earlier, um, which was, I, you know, this idea of like being able to speak truth to power. So there's like a big debate in social science, social science, and especially like in my discipline of sociology about whether you can be like a scholar activist. And it really kind of comes down a lot to status, right? Like, do you get status if you do speak truth to power within the university setting? Like, what is that reward? And because that rewards um, at least in the US and in the UK, and I think in most places, like, you know, peer reviewed publications and so on, um, that gets diminished a little bit. And that also speaks to your question, which you'd asked earlier about what, how do we need to be expanding our knowledge during this time? And I think this gets back to what Jan was saying earlier, this idea of um, you know a lot, but you don't think enough. And I actually think we've seen that during with research during coronavirus, because when you look at the stuff that's been produced about the coronavirus from every discipline, it's like in the millions. Like this is new research that I don't know who's gonna read this, but I don't know that we are thinking, thinking through our new research designs or our, why we are asking the questions very carefully. I think we're trying to fulfill a university function. I think it's very prosaic, right? This is not about knowledge as much as it is about like climbing up the promotion ladder. Mm -hmm. of um, and I think, I mean, one example of this is, you know, I think the issue of paid and unpaid work and how that's divided, like gender equality, I think this really matters. And at the same time, like there's this preponderance of research on the division of paid and unpaid work all over people, pivoting, whatever they were doing earlier, moving to that. And that with not very thoughtful design, research designs that I don't think can necessarily make big claims. So I think we need to rethink that. And maybe like, I mean, I might advocate for like a slow, you know, some people call it a slow sociology but like slow disciplines where you're spending some time thinking why you're asking the questions you're asking even, um, what purchase do they get you? So a little bit about that. With subjectivity, um, what I've thought about it is like, you know, I think, yeah, there's different kinds of knowledge, but I think it's like pretty foolish to think about science or really anything is objective. Like I would very much question that because when you look even at what objectivity in like these kind of, you know, physical hard sciences is like, I mean, historians and philosophers of science have shown this, right? That what was objectivity in the 1700s might be not like what the picture of the, what the rose actually is. It's an ideal form of the rose that then shifted to having a picture of the rose that then shifted to something else. So like even what it means to be objective has not, you know, as historians have pointed out, been his, you know, that's been always historically contingent. So I just, I don't find it a very useful concept, especially in the social sciences where I think it's, um, I think it's, it's an impossible task. And I think all it does is like makes you hide and kind of bury your own um, epistemic kind of preconceptions. I wanted to sort of look at decolonization. We already talked about that and the fact that, you know, we are, uh, we are from India and we are doing this event in the, in the current context. And I wanted to ask our three speakers uh, if, like, you must have looked at many ethical frameworks which have been sort of built responding to the crisis situation. And, uh, and there has been a certain sense in which uh, there has been a neglect many have felt of the global south situation 
because often like you know when you when you look at things like social distancing it's a distant far dream for places like india or africa i guess so what historical or philosophical or sociological lessons do you think could we draw on to make sure that the social context of the countries are taken into account and are not neglected when we are making such frameworks like and do we really think there can be a general ethical framework which could apply to all countries like the one size fits all kind of ethical framework mm. well i think i think from my perspective as a bioethicist um i think it's it's important to recall article 1 of the declaration of human rights which is a visionary article when it states every human being is born free and equal in terms of dignity well an empirical interpretation of this article will say well this is completely crap because we know that to be born in oslo compared to be born in mogadishu uh, is it represents a dramatic difference when it comes to the possibility of living a life where it is possible for those individuals to realize their capabilities so if we think about okay is it possible to develop a, 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 a global ethics framework that is applicable everywhere then it should be designed in this way how can we how can we organize the world both globally regionally nationally and locally in such a way that every human being born on this planet will be able to be and do in the way he or she wants that is to realize her capabilities in the way she wants and we are far from that right. we are far from that but contextualization okay if we really believe the visions of article 1 of the declaration of human rights that everybody is born free and equal in terms of dignity then dignity this article applied means we have an obligation wherever we live and whatever um, power we are entitled to to apply we have an obligation to try to make it possible for every human being to realize her capabilities in the way he or she wants but that need that requires contextualization that requires to put aside the one size fit all thinking would uh, would uh, monica or alia would like to add anything to what jan has said or uh, i'd be happy to it's just um again the, the the great value that i see in a global historical um perspective and I think the history of infectious diseases is the best way to do it precisely because as any epidemiologist will tell you, infectious diseases know no borders. We needed, desperately needed a global framework um, uh, of analysis, um, you know, 15 months ago for the, uh, the, the COVID pandemic. We need it desperately now. Um, uh, and again, this is this is also why I see the focus on epidemics, um, uh, is, which is at least in in my field, history of medicine, is extremely Eurocentric, mm. Eurocentric, uh, um, uh, U.S. centric, um, and it's just like you know the epidemic is over when those those areas are free, or when certain certain cities are free, yeah. then the, the the epidemic is over. Looking at it as a pandemic, you're seeing the continued transmission of, of the pathogen. The pathogen is never over until the pathogen is gone everywhere. Um, and so that means that, that there's no way of excluding um, the, the South. There's no way of, of excluding anybody, even within um, 
you know, the notion that, that Peter Hote has developed a few years ago, this idea of blue, bar, blue marble health, of looking at the pockets of, of poverty and disease, even in the wealthiest countries. Um, we need global health analyses there too. So we need it everywhere. Um, so uh, that's the, the, the very big thing that I would say is um, uh, infectious disease is the best model for, for doing that. What days actually uh, should we have? Like where should we uh, look into, through what perspective we should look into towards knowing the basic cause of uh, the pandemic that has occurred? So like uh, Yad and Alia, if you can elaborate on this, take up discussion. Thank you, Monica. Yeah. Um, I have something to add. I mean, I agree with Monica that it's like, you know, it's about an education campaign. I, I don't necessarily think it needs to be about like teaching science and, you know, immunology. I think that's important. But I think at this point, we we're dealing with really fundamental stuff about not being able to critically discern fact from fiction, right? Like, like exactly. many, especially like, you know, where WhatsApp forwards have like become the new way of getting news or whatever, um, or even news. News has like no facts. You know, the media is like not offering facts. They're just making up whatever. So I think like we need like a very basic respect for evidence and for like what's actually true and what's kind of made up fact that requires some sort of critical thinking um, and teaching that from schools. But also I think this is an ideological thing, right? Like, I mean, this is a kind of um, disdain for expertise. And it's, it's very evident in India where like, um, experts have been consulted for anything and they've been ignored, in fact, blatantly so. Um, it's, it was very evident in the US where, you know, um, like, I mean, you can just see it from the images of like Dr. Fauci, right? Like the way he was when Trump was giving his addresses and the way he is now behind like Biden when he's been like smiling and just been happy or whatever, it's there. It's like, it's the way that scientists and other experts have been treated throughout this. So, I mean, I think, I, I, I think it's like a very fundamental question of um, critical thinking, discerning fact from like non-fact, um, and um, valuing expertise, I guess. Our question on, I, this is for Alia actually, uh, we had thought about that uh, home, like you have talked about how home is an important space during the pandemic. And your book showed that the home is a really important space for thinking about experience of unemployment. Usually when we think about the pandemic, we're thinking about the hospital or we're thinking about, uh, you know, institutes. So we wanted to ask you, do you like, do you feel like you need to attend more to this space, this home, given that there's a rise in both home working and unemployment due to the COVID pandemic? What really motivated you to look at home as this space to talk about this? Sure. So I want to clarify, my book is not about the pandemic, right? My book is about unemployment prior to the pandemic. And what I'm arguing there is that the home becomes a space, like a very gendered space, right? It becomes a sort of resource for men where they get like um, sort of like a demarcated space, like a home office that's either created for them or that's updated so they can job actively. And for women, they're sort of like, you know, well, the whole home is your domain. And so therefore you don't have any specific place there, right? Which kind of works against them in a way. Um, I think it's, I mean, and I also want to clarify that, you know, this is like I said, it's white collar unemployed people, right? So what the home means in that context is very different than what the home might mean for, you know, um, more elite people or lower wage workers and so on. Um, so yeah, in this sort of relatively privileged context, the home serves as an important space for basically reinforcing gender, gender roles. Um, that's an argument I'm making. And I think, again, for similarly privileged workers during the pandemic, that's kind of, that seems to be playing out a little bit. Like I, we don't actually have data on this yet. Um, of any kind about um, how people kind of shared the home when everyone was home all the time, including people who would normally have gone to, you know, offices or whatever it might be to work in. But um, it does seem that it might have been a sort of, you know, replication or perpetuation of what I kind of found that, you know, who gets like the more, the bigger space, the better space and who doesn't. Um, that those kinds of processes playing out. So I think that's that's been important. I think that this matters for this kind of revolution and homeworking that everyone thinks is coming. Um, I don't know if that's going to come because when you already look at corporations, a lot of them are want their employees back right now. You know, even when it's not that safe, or they want them back very. They want to start having that conversation. So I don't know whether that whether that's going to happen or not. This is a question for Jan. Uh, 
so there have been a lot of emphasis on decolonizing medicine and health and this is somewhat what sara had also raised in her comment and you had also answered to her so on one hand many a times the indigenous traditions though they are effective in many cases could be say pseudo scientific especially in the pandemic situation there have been many versions of indigenous remedies for coronavirus which have sort of misled many people on the other hand there is the challenge that perhaps it is because we are largely eurocentric or colonized at least intellectually that we only support certain ways of looking at health and medicine so how do you really look at this conflict between fact and values in what way does the decolonization relate to research ethics i do think that you have answered the last question but the facts and the values tension uh, what do you feel about that well it's 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 a huge question let me let me try to answer part of it by you know uh one of the ironies of nature is that some of the cost poorest countries in the world are some of the richest countries in the world with regard to biodiversity what we see now since more than 15 years back is a dramatic um race which in some way is similar to the gold rushes in the 18th century um where there were races to be the first to dig the different gold mines um in the US in sub-Saharan Africa in Latin America and then also um the context of that colonialization what we now see is a new form of colonialization but much more subtle what happens is that because of the enormous potentials of genomic technology and genomic knowledge we see that researchers from the global north is traveling to india to other asian countries to the amazonas to sub saharan africa to identify plants microorganisms that can be used to uh, develop uh, the next generation of drugs and medicines what they do is they identify them then travel back to the countries uh, and and um, get access to the genetic code and then apply for patents this is a new form of colonization and robbing uh, of the richness of these parts of the world but it's much more subtle um the killings are not so direct and visible uh, and what we see also is a growing um tendency to what i would call collaborative injustice i remember i was i was uh, organizing a capacity building um workshop in tanzania on research ethics and one of the participants he said i have participated in many international research projects but i have never been acknowledged as co-author yeah. is this he said collaborative justice no this he said is collaborative injustice so i have pleaded because i have had the luck of of uh, giving a lot lot of uh, lectures and presentation on this in both sub saharan africa and latin america what these countries and also in asia what these countries should do is to join forces and 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 implement implement uh regulations that make these countries the masters of their own biological resources if not in 20 years time the affluent countries in the world will have been able to rob also these gold mines and turn it into investments for themselves mm -hmm.